Raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the game's, game's Odyssey, Odyssey open. open. Welcome to the Games Odyssey podcast, your home for stories of glory from Olympia to now. I'm Jonathan Jordan. And I'm Sarah Patton. And I feel a little weird doing this so quickly into the show, but Sarah, I've got to go ahead and change up my introduction from when we introduced ourselves in the opening ceremony. So yeah, you, do. you know about this, but in the past couple of weeks, I became a dad again. And Yay. that was very unexpected. And I know that sounds crazy to probably most people <laughs> listening, because it's like, how can that be unexpected? But uh, we have been in the process of adopting uh, again for a little while. And uh, very kind of unexpectedly, we ended up getting matched with uh, a little boy. Again, we're not going to get into the whole story here, but let's just say uh, I've been going through the newborn stuff the past couple of weeks. I'm a little bit tired. So this could be a really interesting episode since I am operating <laughs> off of a lack of sleep. But yeah, so there's a little personal update is that I'm now a father of two and that's exciting. Yes. At it's least for so me. It's so exciting. <laughs> it's so exciting. Congratulations to you and your family. Anyone who knows you yeah. is not surprised of how this unfolded. Um, just because this tends to yeah. be the way that things go sometimes for y'all, but it's super exciting. It does. And um, yeah, we're mm -hmm. just thrilled for you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And people have been so amazing uh, to help out. But yeah, so a lot of changes in our home over the past couple of weeks, but all good things. Just very, very tired and lots of caffeine flowing freely in our house. So uh, as Sarah, I'm sure you can imagine since you have a little one and went through that not too long ago, the newborn phase. Yes. So. Yes. Get the caffeine. That's, that's what you need. That's how you get through and a, and a <laughs> lot of grace, lots of caffeine and a lot of grace. Yes. <laughs> and then kind of the second thing I wanted to jump in, especially if you have been listening to the first few episodes, you've probably already figured this out by now, but guess what? We are not experts. We've said that before. I'm going to go ahead and say it again. Um, you know, Sarah, part of the fun, I guess is the right word, of editing these episodes is sometimes I run across things we say and I'm like, well, that's just not right at all. And yeah, I mean, sometimes we're going to get things wrong and we don't catch it until later on. You know, we're going to get the pronunciation of some names wrong. I mean, goodness gracious, I have enough trouble pronouncing English names sometimes. So... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so it's one of those things that, you know, we're human, we're not perfect, but we're trying. So if we butcher a name, we apologize in advance, especially with this episode, since we are talking about the 96, uh, that is the 1896 games. And there's a lot of Greek athletes who attended that one because it was in Athens. So no surprise. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, and feel free to cut this out. So, you know, a, a story about my background is that before my family moved to North Texas, we lived in a bunch of small towns. And a consequence of that is that I had a very, very thick Texas accent. And some people listening to this, if you're not from Texas, I might sound like a Texan. However, I tend to hide my <laughs> accent. But let me tell you, when I was little and I moved to Dallas I had friends on the playground who would get me to say certain words because it sounded funny. So I used to say things like sidewalks instead of sidewalks. And then they'd say, Sarah, say why? And I'd say, why? Why do y'all want me to say why? And so all of that to say that when it comes to pronunciation, I am constantly in recovery over here to try to speak English correctly. Um, so, so that just goes into the whole, it is a struggle, but we are doing the best that we can. <laughs> yeah. You guys don't realize this, but this is actually speech therapy for us. That's really what this podcast <laughs> is about is us figuring out how to say things correctly. And yeah, we're going to always have those struggles, but we are trying our best. So if we butcher something, we always apologize in advance. Uh, same thing with not just pronunciations, but even facts, but Again, if we ever get something wrong like that, that's huge. We don't mind hearing about it. We don't mind learning uh, from it uh, because we're, we're not historians. We just really enjoy looking into these stories, right? 
so we kind of approach this show with a sense of comedy, even though we are not comedians. And so if that means you laughing at our pronoun, you know, pronunciations of <laughs> and our mistakes, then so be it. Uh, we will laugh along with it too. Anyway, just kind of wanted to get that out of the way now before we dive in. Because this episode is going to actually have to be split into two parts. Uh, Sarah, digging into the 1896 games, there were just too many great stories that I just could not cut out. If you are jumping into this podcast brand new and maybe you haven't listened to the previous episodes, I want to do kind of a, a quick little recap of a couple of things that we've discussed so far that will help set the stage for 1896 Athens. So the ancient Olympic Games, they officially ran from 776 BC to 393 AD as a religious festival to Zeus. You can go back and listen to those episodes later if you want to. The very first Olympic champion was a guy named Corobus. He was a cook from the city of Elis when he won the Stadion foot race and earned his place uh, for all eternity as that first Olympic champion. We didn't even think about this at the time of recording that episode. This means that the Greeks actually gave us three things. They gave us the Olympics, they gave us democracy, and with Corobus, Cor see, butchering a name right there, <laughs> they gave us fast food, right? I love it! Yes! <laughs> I So yeah, next time that I go to Chick-fil-A, I'm just going to be thinking, thank you, Greece. Thank you, Greece, for the fried chicken. You know, I tried that go. joke out with my wife, and she did not think it was funny, but whatever. Someone out there will think it's funny. And then the modern Olympic Games came about as a combination of Greek independence, a rise in the popularity of sports throughout the world during the 1800s, and we covered him in a previous episode, uh, in fact, our last episode, an eccentric Frenchman named Pierre de Coubertin. So if you're jumping in right now, I want you to at least have those basics. So, Sarah, let's head to Athens. Well, maybe not physically, but but historically speaking, in 1896. Sarah, do you remember 1896? Oh, totally. I was right there for it all. No, just kidding, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> there were a lot of things going on in 1896. Um, 1896 is the year that x-rays were discovered. And you know, living in 2022, I, it's hard to imagine a world without x-rays, especially thinking about the Olympics and how an athlete gets hurt. They can get an x-ray almost on the spot. And this was not a thing mm -hmm. back then. In April, on April 4th of 1896, to be exact, the first known women's basketball game was played between Stanford and the University of California. So we're seeing some growth in women's sports at the time, which we are here for. Um, we think that's great. Yep. This one is really interesting. But in 1896, the shortest war in recorded history took place. Um, on August 27th, it was the Anglo-Zanzibar War. How long do you think the war lasted? I mean, I feel like for a war, you have to at least have a couple of days. That's a fair assumption. But it lasted for 45 yeah. minutes. Um, so it's weird to qualify it as a war, but it's considered a war. So 45 minutes of shelling, bada bing, bada bing. And okay. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, since we're history lovers, we could do a deep dive on that, but that's not what we're here for. But Pathé, one of the oldest film companies in the world, was founded in France by the Pathé brothers. They still have Pathé movie theaters in Europe. I mean, yeah. I love, I love movies. I every now and then catch a foreign film and yeah, Pathé's very much known to me. William McKinley was elected as president of the United States. And then mm -hmm. one major thing that happened in 1896, which brings us here today, was the first Olympiad of the modern Olympic Games. There we yeah, go. That's absolutely what we're here for. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, before we get into the specifics of what those games look like. We've already kind of covered a little bit about how they came up and how they were planned. But since we are going to have to divide this episode up into two parts, go ahead and give us a couple of highlights that we're going to talk about. 
All right, so let's talk about the dates. We are going to talk about mm -hmm. how the games were held from April 6th through April 15th. So um, they were they were pretty short, considering that some Olympiads seemed to go a lot longer. There were 14 total nations that participated with 241 athletes. The 241 athletes competed in nine different sports. And among the nine sports, there were 43 events total. So thinking, you know, gymnastics, you break it down into multiple events. Same thing with athletics right. and so on and so on. The marathon... Sure was created specifically for the Athens Games. So thank you for having the Olympics. We have marathons. And then the team from the United States almost did not make it there. But despite that, they ended up walking away with 11 first place finishes. I mean, we're from the U.S., so it may seem like we're being pretty biased in this episode uh, because we are going to talk a lot about U.S. athletes. But I want to defend that a little bit before we get into some other things. Yes, part of it is our bias, but part of it is also you have to remember that Coubertin's vision for the Olympic Games was for it to be a truly international event, which meant he wanted there to be more than just European nations participating because there were already other European contests in existence at the time. So it was really essential for the U.S. team to participate. And it was hard enough to get that participation because the government didn't care. They didn't support the team. It was very much thrown together. So it's a pretty important piece of the history to highlight that the U.S. was involved when they were still very much isolationist in their policies. And that helped shape the future of the games as a whole. So... You know, our apologies to all of our friends from other countries. I promise we're going to highlight you guys as well. Before we get into that, let's take a quick little break, and then we'll come back to fill in a little bit more of the background of how the games came to be. All right. So at the time, the 1896 Olympic Games in Athens was to be the most ambitious, the largest international sporting event ever planned. So definitely Coubertin's vision and the original IOC, their vision was to see something bigger and grander than had ever been planned before. So speaking of Coubertin, he actually proposed that the first modern Olympiad to actually be held in 1900 in Paris, because he thought, hey, we can piggyback with the 1900 Universal Exposition that was being planned at the time. And he thought that would give it more traction, that people would pay attention to it uh, because of it running alongside an established and popular event uh, like the World's Fair. Now, he ended up being really wrong about that. And that's a whole other story that we'll cover in the 1900 episode. He ended up being voted down by the other members of the IOC. Uh, they felt that waiting so long to put the games on would actually lessen the interest in the games, that they would lose momentum. And honestly, they were probably right about that, because this was 1894 when they were finally agreeing with him to put them back on. And the idea of waiting six years, I, I think they were <laughs> I think they were right about that. And yeah. Coubertin eventually came around. Um, now, I did not know this until digging into this a little bit, but London was actually considered as a possible first host city. Had you ever heard that before? You know, I don't think that I did. I feel like any time yeah. there's something going on, London seems to always be the perpetual backup plan. <laughs> so thank you, London, I guess, for always being there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and it was considered, and I think in part because we talked about in the Coubertin episode about the Winlock Games being mm -hmm. in England and how much inspiration he took from the English system of education and incorporating sports into that. So I think that was part of why London was considered, but frankly, it seems like the English were just not that interested in the idea at that point. Uh, again, the Olympics weren't a big deal yet. Uh, so yeah, they just didn't really seem that interested. And the rest of the IOC, uh, eventually, they all unanimously settled on Athens since Greece was the home of the ancient games anyway, which for me is kind of like, duh. So 
The first president of the IOC from 1894 to 1896 was Demetrius Vicalis, a Greek businessman and writer. Now, in late 1894, after they had gotten on board with the idea of resurrecting the games, committee members presented a report that the games would cost three times what they originally thought, thus establishing a well-known Olympic tradition of going over budget. It's amazing how we haven't gotten past that one quite yet. Yeah, I was going to say that um, tradition certainly lives on. <laughs> It sounds really familiar. So yeah, the total cost of the games was going to be 3,740,000 gold drachmas. I tried to figure out what that was in dollars. I was unsuccessful in that attempt, but I think we can agree it doesn't sound cheap. As you can imagine, that price tag kind of put a little bit of a damper on the excitement and the Greek government was a bit reluctant to play host at that point. There was also the very minor inconvenient fact that there were no facilities ready to actually host this really ambitious idea. You might recall from our last episode, we talked about the Zappos Olympiads. Well, when they put the first one of those on in 1859, they just used a public square in, <laughs> in Athens. So not really a feasible concept for a big international event. Now, speaking of Zappos, he had left behind a ton of money because he, he passed away not long after that event. Uh, but he left behind a lot of resources that could be used for reestablishing the games. But ever since his death, the Greek government seemed to have conveniently forgotten about that. I mean, math is hard. I, I get that. There was no QuickBooks back then. So I'm going to give them a little bit of a benefit of a doubt that there were just yeah. other things going on. We'll be, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll land on the kind side of things. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. If you that. have other opinions. Anyway, <laughs> uh, thank goodness. Zappos' cousin, Constantinos Zappos, came forward to remind them, hey guys, remember my rich cousin, Evangelos? He left behind a bunch of money for this. Where is that exactly? Uh, so I guess they, they found the money at that point and realized, okay, maybe we can pull this off. Um, also coming to the rescue was Georgios Averroff, a wealthy Greek businessman who donated 920,000 drachmas to build the necessary facilities and to do a second refurbishment of the Panathenaic Stadium there in Athens, which would be the main site for a lot of the events. Now, there's actually still a statue of Averroth uh, outside of the stadium as a tribute to his generosity. And he got other Greek businessmen to take an interest in the games and throw their support behind it. So he was the main donor, but he did rally some other people to come in and donate as well. So, well, yeah, the least 18... they could do is make a statue for him. I mean, <laughs> we saw in the OG Olympics, they were all about making statues for people, making statues for coaches, making statues for Zeus, making statues for cheaters, making statues for, well, Kainiska, who we talked about, making a statue of herself. So, yeah, let's continue the tradition. Let's make more statues. Maybe that's what the world needs. And then in 1895, so we're getting closer to the games here. Things are getting a bit more urgent. Uh, Coubertin and Vicalis worked together to make Crown Prince Constantine the president of the organizing committee. He was a really eager supporter of the games. And so they knew that having a royal on their side, uh, both to help with convincing the government to help out with different things and to get public favor, it was going to come in really handy for them. So that was a really smart move for them to invite him into the plans. Now, once they had the venue problem settled, there ended up being seven venues in total for them to use. Uh, one of them we've already mentioned, the Panathenaic Stadium. That was used for athletics, wrestling, weightlifting, and gymnastics. In 2004, archery was actually held there. And uh, it served as the marathon finish line, too, both in 1896 and uh, in the 2004 games. There was the Zepion that got built, which was named in honor of Evangelos Zappos. That was where they had the fencing competitions. 
And then, Sarah, where do you think they put the swimming pool for the swimming events? Hmm. I feel like I know this, but I feel like you should tell me about it. <laughs> there was no swimming pool. Um, they didn't want to spend the money. <laughs> yeah. And they said, look, who needs an aquatic center? We have the Mediterranean Sea right here. Uh, so they decided to use the Bay of Z for swimming competitions, which that led to some really interesting things we'll talk about, uh, probably in part two. I guess you can technically count this as a venue, but the city of Marathon served as the starting point for the marathon, and it also factored into some of the cycling events. But uh, let's talk just a tad about the Panathenaic Stadium. It has a really fascinating history. We're not going to get too in detail in it. We'll have a blog about it, but we still need to talk a little bit about it since it was the very first modern Olympic stadium. And it's funny calling it a modern Olympic stadium when it's been around since something like the 6th century BC. <laughs> but it is the only all-marble stadium in the world. Unfortunately, even though they had the money to do the refurbishments, time became an issue. And they were not able to complete all of them uh, before the start of the game. So there were sections of the stadium that they used wood planks uh, for some of the seating areas that they weren't able to refinish with marble. I don't know about you, Sarah, but honestly, the wood plank sounds a little bit more comfortable for sitting than the marble. I don't think so. <laughs> do you think Do you think spectators brought their little seat cushions and things <laughs> for the <laughs> events? Now, the stadium was able to hold up to 30,000 spectators, and then the grassy areas right around it could accommodate another 20,000 or so. And based on a lot of the reports, it sounds like the place was packed out and had, you know, just people busting at the scenes for some of the events. I would love to visit it someday, obviously. <laughs> so yeah. that's definitely on my bucket list. Um, tell us a little bit more about who showed up for the games. Yeah, this is one of my favorite parts is talking about all the competitors. As we said earlier, there were 241 competitors. One thing that's really interesting is that 169 of those competitors were Greek. So they didn't have a far way to go. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, athletes yeah. did have to meet the standards of the IOC's amateur code. Only fencing allowed professionals. In some of the research I did, what I found out about the amateur code was if you got paid for doing a sport in any shape, form, or fashion, whether it was the sport you were competing in or not, you were considered a professional athlete. And so in the case of fencing, if you were a fencing instructor, you would be considered a professional fencer, even though you weren't making money from contests because you were being paid by people to teach them how to do it you would not be an amateur. So it was one of those things where I think they wanted to encourage the participation that they decided to add a master's event for the Olympics so that they could get a few more people in there and help generate some buzz. The idea mm -hmm. of national teams did not fully exist at these games and didn't really become a standard practice until the 1906 intercalated games. So that leads to some confusion on how many countries actually participated. And um, some sources say anywhere from 12 to 14 countries, but even that is really iffy depending on how you count a country. Yeah. So even at the end of our last episode, kind of teeing up this episode that there were 12 nations because at the time that's what was counted, but the IOC now recognizes 14 countries. So part of the reason and the discrepancy for the numbers is that Australian Edwin Flack participated. And technically, Australia was not a sovereign nation at the time. It didn't become sovereign until 1901. So he would have been seen actually as a British competitor at the time. But today, the IOC recognizes Australia as a participant in the inaugural games because of Edwin Fleck. So that's one reason that, that gets us up to 13 from the 12. And then also the nation of Chile was originally left off of the list because they had one athlete there, Luis Subercaso, 
Uh, he did not place in any events, and the record keeping there at the games was not great. So unless you placed, a lot of times they kind of ignored that you were there. Uh, and this is really cool, uh, just showing what technology can do for us. Uh, but people have used modern technology to look at some of the old photographs from the games and prove that he was actually there. Because for a long time, Chile has said, like, we were there at the first games. We had an athlete there, and people didn't always believe that because of his name not being included. So it's amazing that now we can say, yes, he was there, and South America was represented at the inaugural games. So, um, you know, if, if he knew about that now, I, I hope Coubertin would be really happy to find out that a whole other continent was represented there. Uh, than maybe what he even realized at the time. So, uh, so yeah. So welcome aboard, Chile. Uh, we're glad that you got to participate in 1896 yeah. with your one. And we've athlete. got the we have um, the pictures to prove it. Yeah. So so that gets us up to the 14 nations that are now recognized as participating. Now, uh, the judges and the officials were all Greek. So unlike today, where you see the judges and officials be a mix from a lot of different nationalities, that was not the case in the early games. Um, Prince George, he acted in a capacity where he would be the final referee if there was a tie among the other judges. And we'll talk about that later on, but that did end up uh, coming up. But yeah, Sarah, I'll kick it back to you. Give us the full list of all those 14 countries that were that were there. Yeah, so we have the United States, which we've already talked about a little bit, and we'll talk more about. And then there was Great Britain, and Great Britain included Ireland. I know that that might anger some listeners from Ireland to hear. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I'm a little incensed yeah. myself because I do have some Irish in me, so I um, I kind of get why they wouldn't necessarily want to be included, but yeah, at yeah. the time, I can see why. Sure. Yep, indeed. I've got some Irish in me too, so I get it. Um, what's interesting is that the UK technically didn't send a team because, oh, they just, you know, kind of like what you said earlier, they just were not that excited about the Olympic Games and just didn't care. So many of the British athletes were only there because they worked at the British Embassy in Athens and wanted to take part for the fun of it and represent their nation. So talk about being at the right place at the right time. You're just working at the embassy and decide, oh, okay, I'll go to the Olympics. Why not? Switzerland was there. Then you have Austria, Bulgaria, Germany, Denmark, Hungary, Italy, Sweden, Chile, which we just spoke about, France, and of course, the host nation of Greece. The Greek athletes included athletes from Cyprus which was a protectorate of the UK at the time, Smyrna and Egypt. So it's really interesting to think about you had Greece, but then you had all these other places represented mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And, you know, you can't have a history podcast without bringing up Egypt. So Egypt is always going to nope. find a way to be in there. <laughs> Belgium and Russia had also entered the names of competitors, but they withdrew just before the start of the games. Incredibly, 10 of the participating nations won medals at the Games, which were held from April 6th to April 15th, 1896, at least according to the Gregorian calendar. Back then, Greece used the Julian calendar, so the first date by their calendar was actually March 25th. This caused some scheduling confusion, which made the team from the U.S. from the USA almost miss the games entirely. So that's pretty wild that a date mix up because of using different calendars almost kept the United States out. You can't imagine <laughs> anything like that happening today. It would no. be just unheard of. But uh, but at that time, you know, it, it, it makes sense mm -hmm. <laughs> that it, a mix up like that could happen. Absolutely. Only men were able to participate, which, of course, they were. Uh, the, the ladies were, were coming. We're coming. Not yet, but our time is coming. Um, yep. This is always something that's interesting to me, is that winners received a silver medal, an olive branch, and a diploma. Second place athletes received a copper medal. And third place, well, you probably got a pat on the back. 
So gold, silver, and bronze medals <laughs> did not start until 1904 and wouldn't become the official standard until the 1906 Intercalated Games in Athens. The IOC has retroactively reassigned these medals and recognizes third place as bronze, but at the time, those athletes didn't really benefit from that. And so, um, you know, if you are listening to this, you go do your own research, you pull up the 1896 games, the 1900 games, um, you look at medal tables and you'll see people that were given gold, silver, and bronze. And so whenever we're talking about this, um, yeah, that was because the IOC went back and reassigned them. So it's not because we're lying. It's not because we're making up stuff. Um, this was just done later on, which is really interesting because it's like if you have a grandparent that competed at the Olympics, would you have said, oh, he was a bronze medalist? Because technically he didn't get it. You know, I, I don't know. I just I think that's really interesting to think about. But no matter what, you were there. You got third. Yeah, that's something worth bragging about. <laughs> yeah. And we'll probably put it up on the uh, the Instagram post for this episode. But uh, Sarah, I think you and I both have pictures of medals uh, from the mm -hmm. 1896 games. And yeah, there's there's a silver one and there's a copper one and nothing else <laughs> because that's all that they had for those games. Let's go ahead and kind of transition into talking about the first uh, Team USA and the difficulties that they had in, first off, just putting a team together, but then even getting over to Athens. Because, again, the Olympic Games were not a big deal yet. Uh, it would take quite a while for them to become a big deal. So it was just not seen as something terribly important. And why would you even want to participate in something happening thousands of miles away? So most of the American team were actually students from Harvard University, Princeton University, or they were members of the Boston Athletic Association. Uh, the team actually trained at the Pennington School in Pennington, New Jersey, while they were preparing for the first modern games. Uh, there were no U.S. trials. There were no qualifiers. Uh, those who could go did. Uh, though a couple of the athletes, uh, James Connolly and William Hoyt, they were both denied permission to go to the games by Harvard officials. So they left school anyway, and both of them became Olympic champions, uh, Connolly in triple jump and Hoyt in pole vault. And Do you think they would consider it worth it? I think so. <laughs> yeah. uh i, I mean they, they obviously made yeah they made their choice uh i don't think they regretted it uh one bit but you know it was kind of this idea that if you were going to be a serious academic then you shouldn't be that concerned about sports like you know that was something fun to do on the side it was a hobby but not something to give up time away from school for uh, so just very different mentality uh, with how we look at collegiate sports now. Uh, according to history.com, and I'm going to read this verbatim the way they had it on the article there, the American team left for Athens amid complete indifference from the U.S. public and without the support of either amateur athletic officials or even their colleges. Thrown together at the last minute, they had the look and feel of a playground pickup team. They then they went out and achieved a level of excellence that stunned everyone, including themselves. Virtually anonymous one minute, they became overnight sensations and created a storm of sudden attention in Europe and back home. Had they not succeeded, it's very likely the American Olympic movement would have died a quiet death or at least been delayed for years. So it's a pretty huge deal that even though they didn't have support, that they were able to catch that vision as well. Uh, so of the 14 Americans at the Athens Games, 12 won medals, and that's including the retroactive bronze medals that are now recognized, uh, specifically for Francis Lane in the 100-meter dash. Uh, Charles Waldstein, a shooter, and Gardner Williams, a swimmer, were the only two who did not win any medals at the game. So, I mean, that's pretty spectacular for 12 out of 14 to, uh, to place. Uh, most of the Bostonians were members of the Boston Athletic Association. Uh, now, their members actually took up a collection to pay their way to Athens. So there was a little bit of support. So the team had to spend 12 days on a steamship. 
during which they managed only a few short stints of practice on the deck of the boat. Ellery Clark discussed this years later in an article where he wrote, Our first thought, of course, was to keep in good condition during the voyage, and to accomplish this, we cast about us for the best means of getting our daily exercise. The captain, after a single glance at our spiked shoes, promptly forbade their use upon his much-prized deck. Yet rubber-soled shoes did nearly as well, and every afternoon we put on our running clothes and practiced sprinting, hurdling, and jumping on the lower deck. My own specialty, the high jump, was rendered especially interesting by the pitching and rolling of the vessel. If the deck was going up, about two feet was the limit which you might attain. If down, there came the glorious sensation of flying through space. A world's record appeared to be surpassed with ease, and your only fear was of overstaying your time in the air and landing not upon the decks again, but in the wake astern. <laughs> Wow. So, wow. Wow. We need a movie made about this because I just need a visual. I just wish I could see what it looked like. Yeah. You know, I've mentioned before um, kind of my, my love-hate relationship with the 1896 miniseries that NBC uh -huh. did back in the 80s. And, and they kind of show a little bit of this, but it, it's not terribly accurate. Uh, but yeah, it would be interesting to see how they dealt with those conditions. Um, so anyway, so that, that was the voyage part of it on the ship. And then uh, they had to make their way uh, over to Naples, Italy. Now, from Naples, Italy, the team had to take a train to Brindisi, which is on the east coast of Italy. And from there, they would take another boat to Patras, Greece, and finally another train to end up in Athens. So the trip in total lasted for 17 days. I mean, I think about just traveling for one day and how tired I am after that. So they were exhausted when they arrived in Athens and they were surprised that they were met with fanfare because the games were starting literally the day that they arrived. Mm -hmm. Because of the calendar mix up that you mentioned earlier, they thought they were going to have some time to kill to kind of rest up to acclimate to the weather, uh, to get some more practice in, but they actually showed up just in time for the official opening speech by King George I. So better late than never, I guess. My goodness. I mean, they had to, they had to be in pretty great shape to be able to show up and just be able to compete like that. Um, Cause like you said, I'm exhausted after a long trip and mm -hmm. I can't imagine how they felt. Uh, that's, I mean, it's pretty incredible that we walked away with, as many victories as we did. <laughs> and and on that note, actually, the American team uh, became really popular while they were there in Athens. Uh, they actually befriended members of the Greek royal family. Ellery Clark, who I just uh, read that passage that he wrote from an article, uh, he ended up winning two events, and he even sewed the arms of the Greek royal family above the American flag on his jersey. That's and so then sweet. during a post-Olympic I know, right? Yeah, just kind of paying homage to their the Greek hospitality. And then during a post-Olympic reception, some of the Americans demonstrated baseball to members of the Greek royal family. Uh, they used a walking stick for a bat and an orange for a ball. But that came to an abrupt end when the crown prince Constantine nailed a pitch that splattered chunks of orange onto the chest of his formal court uniform. And <laughs> American hurdler Thomas uh, Curist later recalled the incident and said that the prince was a good sport about it. But then he went on to add, but I think the Americanization of Greece ended right there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anyway, that, yeah, that's the first U.S. team, kind of the situation that they went through um, heading on over. But yeah, let's take a quick little break and then we're going to get into the opening ceremony and what that looked like. All right. All right. Yeah, you know, I love opening ceremonies. Uh, and I say opening Me ceremonies too. as in, you know, that's always a big part of the Olympics. I just have to get it out there that we know that opening ceremony, there is only one ceremony. So when I say I like ceremonies, it's because I love all the ceremonies, but 
you know, that's a, that's always a point of contention <laughs> among Olympic fans is that it's opening ceremony for one Olympics at a time. So I understand that saying I love all the ceremonies yeah. historically. Okay. Opening ceremony was held on Easter Monday, April 6th. You know, you eat your chocolate bunnies and then you go to the Olympics the next day, right? All right. Sounds good to me. So it was held on Easter Monday, April 6th. <laughs> um, it was hot, but parasols were not allowed because it might block the view. So all these spectators that showed up in the heat, I bet you they're a little jealous that in modern times, a lot of times the stadiums have the enclosed roof and that the you know, we, we can do things about that now that don't block the views of people. I don't know that they're so jealous about it, Sarah, because they're all dead now. So they don't oh, know well, the difference. But maybe that's a little too know, morbid. It is, it is morbid. <laughs> but if they could know it now, I'm just saying, come a far way. It's, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, some sources say that there were more than <laughs> 60,000 spectators there for the opening ceremony. Other sources claim 50,000 were at the stadium with an additional 20,000 taking seats on the hillside above. Whatever is the most accurate among those numbers, I am impressed. That's a lot of people that were able to show up for opening ceremony. Crown Prince Constantine was the president of the organizing committee and gave a speech during the opening ceremony. Then his father officially declared the games open with the words, I declare the opening of the first international Olympic Games in Athens. Long live the nation. Long live the Greek people. I mean, I'm inspired. <laughs> Sounds I good am. to me. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And, you know, that's a that that a part of that is something that we still see today when the official declaration of the games being mm -hmm. open takes place. There was not exactly yep. a parade of nations, but the athletes did line up on the infield by nation. The Olympic hymn was performed for the first time by a choir of 150 singers. And interestingly enough, there was no cauldron lighting yet. That would come several years later, but no athletes oath. They just started competing. So skip a lot of the formality. Let's just have fun. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of, as much as I love the modern opening ceremonies uh there's a part of me that's kind of like yeah i like this idea of you just start right away just get right into it and uh we do on our youtube we do have a playlist specifically for 1896 and you can actually see some of the opening ceremony and some of the events on there so it's it's pretty amazing that again the olympics were not a big deal yet but it's amazing that there were people there with movie cameras and they were able to capture those moments for us to enjoy today. So I would encourage you after the episode is over, when you need to kill some time at work on YouTube, uh, go, go watch uh, that video. Cause it's about 10 minutes long and it's really, really cool to actually see what it looks like at the real life opening ceremony and events. We'll go ahead and talk a little bit about the events. So you had athletics, which was 12 total events, including the first ever international marathon race. You had gymnastics with eight total events. You had tennis, which had two events. Shooting had five events. Weightlifting, two events. Wrestling, one event. We'll talk about that with the wrestling, how there were no weight divisions. Uh, swimming had four events. Fencing had three events. And then cycling had six events, with cycling actually being broken down into two disciplines. There was one road cycling event and then five track cycling events, okay, to make up the total of six. Sailing was also on the program, but it had to be canceled it's a little vague why. Uh, there's a couple different reports. The English report on the cancellation said that it was because the special boats for the event had not been prepared. And yeah. then the German version of the report went a little bit further than that, saying that not only were there no boats, but no one had registered for the event. So, yeah, no boats, no people, no event. Stands to reason. Huh. Well, that stinks. That would have been my opportunity. Yeah, so sailing, 
I know, yeah. Sailing missed out on the 1896 uh, games, but it would come along pretty soon. Uh, now, since we will not be able to talk about all the events in this part of the episode, we're just going to focus on athletics for now. Sarah, tell us, uh, tell us why athletics was such a big deal. Well, athletics had the highest representation of nations of all the disciplines, probably because it also had the most events. So that makes sense. More opportunities, more representation. The first final to be held on the first day of competition was for the triple jump, which was then known as the hop, skip, and jump, which to me, that seems to make sense. Because if you watch triple jump, it is like a hop, a skip, and a jump. It was won by American James B. Connolly when he jumped 13.71 meters, more than a meter ahead of second place. With that, he became the very first Olympic champion since AD 385, which it's pretty cool. Uh, but tell us more about James Connolly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of Irish and the luck of the Irish, he was born October 28th, 1868, as the son of Irish immigrants. He grew up in South Boston, Massachusetts. He actually never went to high school, but he had a love of sports throughout his life. And around 1895, so about a year before the Games, he was feeling a bit dissatisfied with the course of his life and the direction it was taking. So he decided to pursue self-education. And he ended up being accepted at Harvard, even though he hadn't <laughs> finished high school, um, where he went on to study classics. So needless to say, he was a smart guy to be able to do that. Now, his dean at Harvard actually counseled him not to make the trip to Athens, even going so far as telling him that his low academic standing could keep him from being readmitted as a student. But Connolly decided to ignore that. He really, really wanted to go. Uh, during their stop in Naples, Italy, that I mentioned earlier, he was robbed and almost lost his ticket to Athens because his ticket was in his wallet. So what did he do? He chased after the robber and managed to get it back. Just warning to all you pickpockets out there. Never, never steal from you know, an Olympian. After Connolly's return from the Olympic Games, he was welcomed back to Harvard as a hero, and his professors apologized profusely for not believing in him. Just joking, he was expelled. Yeah, it makes me so angry. Those professors didn't know what they had in him. Yeah, but again, the Olympics were not a big deal yet. You kind of I mean, have to keep fair. that in view. Not agreeing with their actions one bit, but from their standpoint, he had ditched school for what they considered a, a waste of time and basically just a vacation is the way that they looked at it. You know, on top of that, you know, the rational side of me is like, even if you're an Olympic champion, the rules still get to apply to you. So I guess it's fair that they were trying to be consistent, assuming that that's what they were doing. But still. Yeah, they weren't completely consistent because we're <laughs> going to find out later that William Hoyt got to go back to Harvard while Connolly was expelled. But anyway, um, uh. now in 1898, so two years, uh, two years after the games, uh, Connolly was actually with the 9th Massachusetts Infantry during the Spanish-American War, uh, serving at the Siege of Santiago. So he was a veteran. Uh, he would also go on to compete in the 1900 Paris Games, where he improved on his jump from 1896, but he ended up in second place that time, not able to, I guess, defend his title, but he lost to fellow American Meyer Princeton. Now, he also attended the 1904 St. Louis Games, but that time as a journalist. He did participate also in the 1906 Intercalated Games in Athens, but he failed to make a valid jump in either the triple or the long jump that time. As a writer, he ended up publishing more than 200 short stories and 25 novels, so he was actually a professional writer for the rest of his life. Uh, he never returned to Harvard as a student, but he received an honorary athletic sweater from them in 1948. A year later, Sarah, he was offered an honorary doctorate by Harvard University, which he turned down. 
Which I so, fully support. I support this move. This is, yeah. this might be like th- this guy's life. <laughs> he did so much, <laughs> so much. And I, yeah, I support his decision to be like, mm, Harvard, thank you for this letter, but no, thank you. I don't need you. I've had a great yeah. life. Yeah. To reiterate, yes to the sweater, no to the doctorate degree, you know, priorities. Now, he did eventually, it seems like, make peace with Harvard because he did return there to speak on literature when they invited him to come as a lecturer. Uh, that was 50 years later on. And so I guess by that point, it was water under the bridge. Um, I mean, he had been very successful in his career. So O'Connelly lived to the age of 88. He passed away on January 20th, 1957, uh, while he was living in New York City. And then, yeah, Sarah, uh, who else was on the team with Connolly? Along with Connolly, we had American Thomas Burke, and he won the 100-meter race in 12 seconds, and he won the 400-meter race in 54 seconds, which that's still pretty impressive considering the tight turns for the track. Um, He was the only one to use the crouch start. His start was confusing to the jury, but they eventually allowed him to use his, as they called it, uncomfortable position. (laughs) <laughs> so I think that's really interesting. They're like, mm, we don't get you, but I guess we'll allow it. Uh, the 800 yeah. and the 1500 meter races were both won by Edwin Teddy Flack. He was born in England, but spent most of his life in Australia. Flack entered five events total, including the marathon, but he did not finish it. I mean, the guy sounds like he was pretty busy. He also participated yeah. in tennis singles and was retroactively recognized as a bronze recipient for tennis pairs by the IOC when they updated the results later on. So it's really interesting. It's not just that he did multiple events as an athletics participant with running. He also played tennis, and that's really rare that we see that. Mm-hmm. Um And by rare, I mean, here in modern times, we never see that in the Olympics that I can think of. You might have crossover sports where someone switches, but not doing both sports at the same Olympics. So props props to our buddy, Teddy Flack. Um, Greeks were expecting to win discus and shot put, but they actually came in second to American Robert Garrett on both times. Um, So tell us a little bit about Robert Garrett. He was from Baltimore County, Maryland. Uh, He was born into a wealthy shipping family. Uh, Now, he was actually an athletic star at Princeton, and he was the captain of the track team there during his junior and senior years. Now, uh, he came in first in discus and shot put, as you just mentioned, and he also came in second in high jump and long jump. So he had a very successful time there. And Also, because he did come from a well-to-do family, he actually paid for three of his teammates to be able to travel to the games with him. Well, I love that. Okay, technically, technically his mother, Alice Whitridge Garrett, paid for them. So thanks, Mom. Now, Princeton professor William Milligan Sloan, uh, he was actually the one who convinced Garrett to try discus. But here's the deal. It was not popular in America. And I don't mean not popular as in just not many people doing it. Literally, no one was doing discus in America at the time. So they didn't they didn't have one to buy. They they literally hired a blacksmith to make a discus for them based on pictures from Grecian art. Okay. The resulting discus that the blacksmith made for them was 14 kilograms. That's 30 pounds. And it it was just impossible to throw for any kind of distance. So when he got to the Olympics and saw the actual discus being used by the Greeks and that it was only five pounds, he decided to go ahead and enter it for fun. So, yeah. No practice whatsoever with the discus, okay? Now, let's talk about where this kind of ended up uh, not being so great for the Greeks. Because discus is part of their heritage. It was a really big deal for them. They used a classical discus style called the discopulus, which was supposed to also look beautiful in appearance. So it was a lot of focus on their form in the appearance. There was an element of grace to it. Garrett, on the other hand, threw the discus kind of like a hammer throw, okay? So 
no style whatsoever. Uh, in fact, one source that I found said that his first two attempts were really clumsy and messy. He nearly injured people sitting in the stands and everyone was laughing at him, including himself. So he had a sense of humor about himself. He was able to laugh it off. But then his third attempt, which he delivered with a loud grunt. The discus went sailing 19 centimeters, that's seven and a half inches, past the throw by Greek Paraskevopoulos for a throw of 29.15 meters, uh, that's 95 feet, eight inches. So, yeah, so he ended up <laughs> winning, honestly, accidentally. L let's face it. <laughs> um, I, I was going to say, I cannot imagine being no, go ahead. A, a Greek athlete and thinking like, wow, this guy, he's he's funny, but thinking like, oh, I'm not taking him too seriously. And then he's the guy that ends up winning. Like, my heart breaks a little bit for yeah. the Greeks that <laughs> thought they had it, it in the back. It but does. it's also it's also it such a great no. story for Garrett to he finally got it together. No, I feel the same way. Like I, I feel bad for the Greeks because this should have been their event. It really should have been. No one would have guessed this. In fact, uh, an American spectator in the stands who was watching this play out uh, named Burton Holmes, he wrote, all were stupefied. The Greeks had been defeated at their own classic exercise. And according to our friend James Connolly, who we were just talking about, uh, the winning Americans in five of the track and field events had not had a single day of outdoor practice since the previous fall. Um, you know, again, they got a little bit of exercise on the ship over, but not a full-fledged practice like we would think about it. So Garrett also won shot put, uh, which he had actually practiced. So that's a little bit of a different story, but he won that with a distance of 11.22 meters. That's 36 feet, 10 inches. And he finished second in the high jump, uh, tying with James Connolly at 1.65 meters. That's five feet, five inches. And he got second in the long jump with a jump of six meters even. That's 19 feet, eight inches. Uh, he did return to the Olympic Games for the 1900 Paris Games. He got third place in shot put and standing long jump. So now in the records, he's retroactively considered a bronze medalist for those games as well. Uh, with his win in the discus, do you think he tried to refine his form over the next four years? No, none of his three attempts uh, at discus at the Paris games were counted as legal throws. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I would get why he may not want to, you know, fix something that doesn't appear to be broken, but at least try to have some legal throws, yeah. dude. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you would, you would think he would at least, you know, maybe buy a discus while he was there in Greece, take it home, like as a souvenir. But maybe also practice if he was planning to go again. So anyway, um, it's not me to judge his life. Uh, <laughs> Garrett was also a member of the tug of war team at the 1900 Olympics. But his team was forced to withdraw because three of the six members, himself included, had to go compete in the hammer throw final. Uh, so I guess they said, sorry, but it's hammer time. And they, they dropped out of tug of war. So that's a little <laughs> sad. Um, now, after his Olympic career between 1896 and 1900, uh, he went on to become a banker, financier, investor, philanthropist, you know, all around money guy. And because of his interest in history, he financed some archaeological digs in Syria. Uh, you know, some people collect things like coins, toys, baseball cards. Garrett literally collected ancient manuscripts. That was his thing. Um, and then another American champion who we've alluded to already, uh, William Hoyt. Uh, like Connolly, he was a Harvard student who had been denied permission to go to Athens, but he did it anyway. Uh, he ended up winning the pole vault. And unlike Connolly, Hoyt went back to Harvard and was readmitted and then graduated from Harvard Medical School. I don't know if it was that his grades were better than Connolly's and so it was easier to justify or if his dad knew somebody. I, I don't know the story behind that, but he did uh, finish up at Harvard. 
And then um, the last thing we're going to kind of briefly talk about today for this half of the episode is the marathon. Now, we're going to cover this in a lot more detail when we talk about Spirit on Lewis, uh, but we do need to go ahead and mention it here as well. Uh, the highlight of the Athens Games and the athletics competitions in general was the marathon, which had been created specifically for the Olympic Games. Now, Sarah, I found this really interesting um, because you've run a marathon before, right? I have, yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, yeah, I've, I've run a couple myself. Uh, now, back then, when it was first introduced for the games, it was 40 kilometers, which is 24.8 miles. Uh, so it was a little bit shorter than today's version of 26.2 miles. We'll explain that change when we cover the 1908 London games. But for now, what you need to know is that the event was held on April 10th, 1896. Uh, there were a group of 25 runners that traveled to Marathon for the start of the race, but <laughs> only 17 runners ended up actually competing in it. So I guess there were, you know, eight of them who were just like, yeah, this is crazy. Never mind. And <laughs> decided to hitch their ride back to, to Athens. Uh, I guess it became real on that drive out to Marathon when they felt the actual distance they were going to have to run. <laughs> I think that changed some of their minds. Uh, but there were five nations total represented in the race. Now, of those runners, the 17, uh, nine would finish. And eight of those nine were Greek runners. Our wealthy friend, Georgios Averoff, that we talked about earlier, who helped finance the building of the venues for the games. Um, <laughs> Sarah, you're going to love this. He mm -hmm. offered his daughter's hand in marriage and a million drachma dowry if a Greek man... <laughs> won the race um your thoughts please uh yeah no <laughs> um that's that's quite the prize um not to sound like a gold digger over here but i guess at least <laughs> i guess at least he had some money at this point but still that's wild and it's a good thing we've gotten away yeah. from letting those things happen as part of your prize of the olympics although i mean i don't know i guess some countries could choose to do that but let's hope they don't <laughs> I, I i wonder how their relationship was after him <laughs> yeah. making that pledge like dad you were willing to pay a million drachmas to get rid of me to just any old greek who won this race like i i, I want to know what that dinner uh table <laughs> conversation was like yeah I hope, um, I hope she liked the guy yeah, I mean, thankfully, again, kind of a bit of a spoiler alert, she did not end up having to marry anyone from the race. So, you know, I, I think things uh, probably worked out for her, but still. <laughs> anyway, um, back to the marathon itself. Apparently, there were no formal water stations, uh, unlike what you would see today. So the marathon runners, uh, they actually had to purchase refreshments from shops <laughs> along the way. And... Uh, as I already mentioned, there were quite a few who didn't finish the race, uh, which is still a marathon tradition. There's lots of people who are not able to finish a marathon. It It's very difficult to do. Now, it looks like the Greeks were going to get a podium sweep for the event, uh, but Hungarian Gaiula Kellner lodged a complaint, but he lodged his complaint against third place finisher Spiridon Belikus. And according to History.com, uh, third place finisher Spirit and Bellicus was disqualified for hitching a ride in a carriage along part of the race course. Uh, so Kellner was named as third instead. And I think we can all get behind that. Um, yep. Yep. So again, cheating happened in the ancient Olympic Games and we brought it right back for the modern <laughs> Olympic Games. <laughs> the first chance we could. Um now, the marathon was won by a Greek, Spirit on Lewis. At the time, he was an unknown water carrier and a soldier. He completed it in two hours, 58 minutes, and 50 seconds. Uh, so again, he he did not have to marry Averoff's daughter because he was actually already engaged. So that let her off the hook. And, you know, this was a big deal for him to win because no Greek had won any of the other athletic events. And that loss in discus and in shot put had been really painful for the Greek people. 
Um, now, the same route was used in 2004 Athens Games, but it was lengthened to the modern 26.2 mile standard. So they just adjusted the start line <laughs> by a little bit uh, to get to the 26.2. But otherwise, uh, the route was nearly identical. Um, also, the winner of the men's marathon in 2004, I think it's worth mentioning, finished it in 45 minutes faster than Lewis this time. So it's pretty amazing the advances that we've made uh, since then. Uh, not to take away from his achievement, because it was pretty amazing, uh, given the fact it was a brand new event and there were no water stations. <laughs> but now, uh, there were also reports that a Greek woman named Stamata Raviti attempted to enter the marathon race, but she was denied. Now, Sarah, the official reason for this was because she had not registered in time. Um, I don't believe I, that. I have, yeah, I have some problems with that because Robert Garrett was able to compete in the discus at that moment when he was like, yeah, can I join in? And they were fine with that. Um, so anyway, we'll kind of, uh, you know, yeah. look at that with some suspicion. Now, apparently... She decided not to let that stop her. Uh, she ran the 40-kilometer course the very next day, anyway, and she completed it in five hours and 30 minutes, uh, finishing right outside the stadium. And, you know, I suppose she did that to prove that she could do it, too, even if she wasn't allowed to do it at the official time. And we, we got to give her props. She finished it when a good chunk of the competitors were not able to. So, yeah, pretty cool story. I think she gets hero status, in my opinion, because she showed that she was capable and that women should be able to run. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's also important for us to note that Arthur Blake, who was the only American in the marathon race, uh, he ended up having to drop out. Uh, he was also a student from Harvard. Uh, less than a year later, he and some other members of the Boston Athletic Association would hold the first ever Boston Marathon in 1897. Even though he had to drop out, he loved the idea of the event and was disappointed that he had to drop out. And so he took this idea back to the Athletic Association and said, we should start this up. This should be a tradition for us. And they were on board. So that's where we get the, the Boston Marathon today, which is still, you know, one of the most prestigious marathons in the world and the longest running um, annual marathon in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're about to close things up here. Uh, so Sarah, I kind of have one last question as we start to wrap up. Um, were there any records set for the athletic competitions? There were not, which sounds kind of surprising. Um, it seems like every Olympic Games, there's some kind of world mm -hmm. record being set at least once in the athletics competition. But very few of the top international competitors opted to compete in the Games. And so um, that was one reason. And then the turns at the stadium are very, very tight. So um, there were a couple of factors that played, but yeah. officially, no. No world records were set at the 1896 Games. Yeah, and we'll... You know, Sarah, we'll probably throw up a picture of the Panathenaic Stadium on the Instagram so people can go check it out. I may even throw in a picture of it here on the video version of the episode uh, so people can actually see what those turns look like because it's very different than a traditional track. And, you know, it's it's impressive to think that Thomas Burke, when he won the 400 meters there, it, it's really impressive to think he did that in 54 seconds, considering that they had to slow down a lot during the turns because of mm -hmm. how tight they were. Now, technically, you could say a world record was set for the marathon because no one had ever broken three hours for it before. And of course, this was the first international, you know, holding of the marathon. But I think that's why it's not considered a world record is just because it was so new that that just wasn't documented at mm -hmm. the time. Uh, but right. That's where we're going to stop for now for this half. And we've got a lot more events, a lot more stories to cover in the next episode. Again, I'll reiterate, we're not going to split every Olympiad or Paralympiad into multiple episodes, but there's times it's going to be necessary. And this is definitely one of them because so much of our traditions today and the events that we enjoy uh, in the modern Olympics come from the way they did things in 1896. 
So, for now, if you enjoyed this episode... And we really hope you did. Then you need to go check out our website, gamesodyssey.com. The address is literally in the show notes below the episode description. You can just go tap it and go check it out there on your phone. And while you're at that, you can easily rate, review, and subscribe. We would very much appreciate that. You can also sign up for our newsletter, read a blog, and find links to all of our social media pages. But just in case you want to know what those are for now... Instagram, you can find us at Games Odyssey Pod. On Twitter, you can find us at Games Odyssey Pod. And on Facebook, The Games Odyssey. We will come back to 1896 in the next episode. So until then, Odyssey you later. The Games Odyssey Podcast is a production of Wardrobe Media LLC. This episode was written, hosted, produced, and edited by Jonathan Jordan and co hosted by Sarah Patton. Show notes, including research sources and transcripts, can be found on our website, gamesodyssey.com. Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content features in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.